The history of reptile keeping is really interesting, but let's go all the way back to the 1930s when it wasn't ball pythons or bearded dragons. So what was it and why don't you see those reptiles anymore? Today, let's go over it. My name's Adam, this is Diamond. You're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles. Stick around. to me is really interesting because uh, the 1930s were a very unique time, right? We're talking about between World War I and World War II. We're talking about right during the Great Depression, right? So this is a very unique time where people don't usually have tons and tons of money in the US anyway. For the most part, the landscape is completely different and about to change even more. However, I found some really interesting articles, newspaper clippings, and accounts of the 1930s and reptile keeping, which of course was not as, uh, well, uh, very sparse in terms of reptile keepers. You're not gonna go and find a reptile keeper at the grocery store like you could now. Reptile keepers are a dime a dozen is what I'm saying now, and back in the day, they just wasn't. It was a super niche hobby. Starting off with number five, tortoises. Now there wasn't a specific tortoise that I could find, but all of the articles or clippings from newspapers and magazines that were offering these things, we're talking about like 50 cents for a land tortoise. And what it seems like is that we're probably talking about sulcata tortoises and uh, box turtles actually, it seems like it looks like too. So even though a box turtle is a turtle, I don't know, I mean, in the pet trade, we often call things that they aren't. So it looked like it was a lot of sulcata tortoises because there was a lot of imports from Africa, not really for pickles, but for meat and things like that. We'll get into that in a second. And of course you can imagine how African tortoises got into the US. I mean, let's not get into it, but you can figure that out. And then box turtles also because they're native and they're small and easy. So a lot of animals, it turns out, came into the US for meat, medicine, things like that. So I think that what I, from what I read, tortoises were probably part of that coming over on ships and things like that. Because back in the day, way before the 30s, thankfully, there were ships coming over from Africa. These tortoises were used as food in a lot of cases because you can keep a tortoise on its back for weeks at a time and then, you know, eat it so it's fresh, basically. So there has been tortoises in the US for a while just because of this, some of them get released. And then box turtles are found in the Southern US as well. Now, in terms of now, why you don't really see these, you do. I guess this is a bad example of why you don't see them anymore. The other four, you really don't. But I think that box turtles still aren't really that common in comparison to things like sulcata tortoises. And sulcata tortoises are the third biggest tortoise species on the, in the world. You don't really wanna keep these if you don't have an outside area or a room, basically. You'd want something like the size of what's behind me here. This is a 400 square foot room, right? Something really big if you kept them inside. A lot of UVB, a lot of heat bulbs. It's gonna warm up your house. It's gonna be wild. Or if you live in a place like Arizona, you can keep them outside and that's what people do. Box turtles on the other hand are really cute. They're adorable. I love them. They're fantastic. I had one for a long time. He unfortunately passed. Uh, Floyd came to me in not the greatest condition with metabolic bone disease and things like that. And Anyway, I would definitely consider keeping a box turtle again. They need less space, they eat insects, as it's a varied diet, but most tortoises don't eat insects. Anyway, let's move on to something a little bit more rare. Number four, definitely rare for most keepers, rattlesnakes, and that's for good reason. So what I've realized that most of the animals that were kept back in the day were things that were either wild caught, obviously, and this list is mostly um, US based because that's where the information that I can see most of it comes from and also most of you are American watching this but rattlesnakes were used well for shoes and things like that they're used for their leather so this is I almost said fur they're not used for their fur rattlesnake fur is not that'd be cool though wouldn't it that'd be fluffy rattlesnakes obviously there's many many different species they're endemic to the US the one that I could see, the only picture I could really find from the 1930s, it was very blurry from a newspaper. And I saw this a long time ago. I think it was in a reptiles magazine and it was a diamondback rattlesnake. I don't know if it was Eastern or Western. The picture is like really difficult to make out, but either way, diamondback rattlesnakes are really big Eastern or Western in terms of rattlesnakes. And they 
for a good reason, that's what they would use for the leather because, you know, it's a bigger skin. You need less stitching. You could use more of an actual skin without too much manipulation. So rattlesnake keeping as pets, obviously, I know that it wasn't common then, but people were definitely interested in keeping reptiles before the 1930s. I can do a 1920s list if you want to. That one's going to be fun but it just was uncommon. But of course, you're still gonna have the reptile freaks, right? We're all freaks in a good way that wanted to keep these animals. And rattlesnakes, I imagine, were probably kept in, I don't know, cardboard boxes or wooden crates or something. Plastic wasn't really prevalent. You, don't, you didn't really have plastic containers or totes or things like that. So you can make a wooden box or a crate or something like that. But you're not really going to have enclosures like you have now. So keeping reptiles in the 30s would be much, much different. And assuming that these animals, obviously people weren't really breeding mice and rats for food for reptiles. So you'd be finding wild caught things. I imagine that's what you'd be feeding them is rats because well, in the 1930s, rats were pretty easy to find in a lot of parts of the US. And if you're asking why aren't rattlesnakes kept now, well, uh, common sense mostly for most of us. There are, you know, the 1% of experts, but those guys, everyone else should not keep rattlesnakes. Number three, alligators. Now this is predictable. A lot, it's gonna show up in a lot of these decade videos because alligators are, I mean, basically the most badass thing that you can keep. These things are just really, really interesting animals. And of course they get really big and they're terrible for most people, but they start off really small, they grow really slow, and then eventually people will just let them go. So that whole thing about alligators in the sewer, no, alligators don't live in the sewer. But if you ask me, I mean, where there was indoor plumbing, were alligators put down the drain or down the toilet in the 1930s? Probably. Is there a lot of people who had indoor plumbing? Not really. So I imagine you're releasing these things in ponds and things like that. I don't know of anyone or any accounts of people keeping full grown alligators, but there are lots of newspaper clippings or clippings from this bizarre magazine that I found where you could order these alligators for 15 cents, something like that. I think the article was from 1934. Could be wrong, but either way, it's definitely in the 30 or 38. I forget. Either way, these uh, are animals that are really cute and cuddly when they're babies. And by cuddly, I mean they want to eat you still, but they're fun. They make cute noises. They look cute. And then by the time they grow, I imagine most people aren't keeping alligators. But if you did, you'd probably be keeping them in like a trough, like a stock tank type thing. Um, bathtubs, maybe, but again, like the indoor plumbing thing wasn't huge in the 30s. A lot of homes still didn't have this. So you'd probably be keeping these outside or even inside uh, in a tank and definitely not with UVB and they probably wouldn't grow that well. and Not that well, but probably maybe be sick or have issues. So anyway, obviously there was no UVB bulbs to buy in the 1930s. Number two, this is one for sure you don't see anymore, Chinese terrapins. I don't even know if I've, I mean, it makes sense. I, mean, I know what a terrapin is, Chinese terrapins, there's a bunch of different species, but this is what I found over and over in these uh, clippings where, where they were selling turtles was Chinese terrapins. Now they didn't say which specific species, I found out there's more than one. And this is because, well, in the 1930s, there was a lot of immigration from Asia. The 30s, a lot of this was for Chinese medicine. So there was Asian medicine that was being made with these animals and then of course for food as well. And then obviously when you have that many of them, well, kids think that they're cute and you keep them and that sort of thing, right? And uh, they were kind of sold, not in keychains like you see now in Asia, which is terrible and shouldn't be done, but they were sold at markets, like the type of flea markets and um, like food markets and things like that. So people would keep them. And of course they would keep them literally in sinks or not, well, I guess water basins from back in the day. We're talking like no clean water, like the most ridiculous setup for a turtle, no UVB, no heat bulbs, of course, but people would keep them and they'd last for who knows how long. And even if you were only keeping them as, I don't know, a food source or to grow them up so that you could use them for medicine, these things were kept quite frequently. And these are one of the ones that I found almost on every single list or cutting or news article or magazine article from the 1930s pertaining to reptiles. Chinese terrapins were almost always in these lists. So I don't really know too much about them because we don't keep them into captivity too much now, but they are a pretty big turtle. I mean, they're, you know, the readier slider type size, 30 to 40 centimeters. So say a foot to almost a foot and a half. And that's a pretty big turtle. And number one, people kept big snakes back in the day, but they didn't keep berms or retics. They kept African rock pythons. Now, why were they keeping African rock pythons in the US? This is a big snake that'd be difficult to transport over. Well, 
a lot of the time it was for leather. Now, of course, there were a lot of cases where leather was shipped from Africa as leather. I don't know why you'd bring live snakes over to the US, but there are definitely accounts that I could find of people keeping big constrictors from Africa. Well, that's an African rock python, even if it wasn't called that in these uh, letters or whatever else, right? That's the thing too, is people would write about these and how cool and interesting they were and put them in journal entries as well. These of course are difficult to find. I only found one of these. Obviously these, there wasn't a lot of captive breeding back in the day. It would be cool. Imagine if African rock pythons started to be bred in the 1930s and by now we'd had 50 generations and maybe they wouldn't be the cantankerous buggers that people think that they are now. Whereas most people keep say reticulated pythons or my favorite Burmese pythons because they're just a better snake in most cases have more morphs, which is now would be popular because of money, but also just better temperament. Berms are my favorite snake because they're the best temperament and they're big. I like big snakes that don't want to bite me all the time. And of course the monetary value back in the day was for their leather, not really for anything else. If people were eating them, I have no idea. I mean, it was the 1930s. It is definitely possible that that was the case. But either way, this video was super fun to research. I want you guys to let me know in the comment section, should I do a 1920s or 2010s or what's the next decade you wanna see? And again, thanks so much for the Patreon subscribers. You guys are amazing. You guys get videos early, you guys get dis discounts on merch, you guys get one-on-ones, all that and more for as little as $1 a month. And that's it, because I do videos on Mondays and Thursdays. That means I'll see you in the next one.